church this morning, we have new bulletins. They do not look new on the outside, but on the inside, they have different information. If you'll go ahead and open up your bulletin, I want to walk you through that real quick. So like I said, on the inside, it looks very similar. You got child care, connection cards, online giving, preview services, um, small groups, and grilling and chilling Sunday. All right, first off, I've already noticed something that's, that's wrong when I looked at these. Um, it's not preview services anymore. It should say join us for services. Um, I sent that, but it must have not um, gotten switched. So we'll just bear with us there. Um, so when you see this, one thing we started off, we had preview services because honestly, we didn't know how it was going to take off and things like that. So what we did is we were going to say one say, Sunday a month, we had um, a full service. Um, but now it's switched and we don't have that anymore. So don't even think about that anymore. It shouldn't say preview services. Um, what every Sunday is going to look like is like today. So you come in here. Um, you have service from 10.30 to 11.30. And then you have the option for something called connection groups. And what that means is simply we have leaders that are broken down by section. They'll just come over to you at the end and say like, okay, my group's going to talk over in this section over here. Or my group's going to meet outside. There's no pressure to meet and talk about what we learned about during the sermon. If you need to go, you can. Our children's uh, department is ready for you to come pick up your children there. But if you'll look down what it says, optional small groups, it says, we want New Direction Church to be more than a service you come to. We want to be a family you belong to. And we got a lot of feedback last time from people who were shy, from people who were skeptical about sitting in a circle with other people they didn't know or did know. Um, but what we found is that there was really life in those groups and people really connected and actually knew who the people were that went to church with them. Um, so Matthew's going to tell you a little bit more about that before we break into our groups at the end. Uh, we'll just kind of gather wherever you're at. We have leaders that are going to come to your section and kind of gather you. We'll have a five-minute intermission where you can refill your coffee and get another donut. All right. So then you see grilling and chilling Sunday. Uh, last week we had hot dogs and hamburgers, and it was awesome, and people brought stuff. But uh, we don't expect necessarily for everybody to bring something so that you can stay. I had one person say, but Michelle, I didn't bring anything. Uh, but I said, that's not what it's about. We have enough that you can eat it doesn't matter um so what we want to do is we want to share a meal together we hope that will be every second sunday and when we decided that the next month it was um mother's day so we don't want to do it on mother's day because you're probably going to be with your mother that might not be here um so it's going to be the third sunday next month and so that'll be on may the 15th so you can plan on staying after and eating together for that so the grilling and chilling sundays instead of the small groups afterwards where we get together and just hang out It'll be where we get together, hang out, and eat. So you don't have to worry about getting in groups that day. All right, the next thing I want you to look at is the white envelope in there. That's if you'd like to give in person. Also, you may give online um, by going to newdirectiongc.com. All right, now the green card. It's kind of funny to say green card. All right. So this is what we call connection cards. I'm going to drop this on the floor. All right. These connection cards, you've probably seen them. You've probably heard us talking about them. They haven't really been living. All right. What I mean by that is they just stay in the bulletins. We get them the next Sunday. Because it doesn't make sense to people who come every time to fill out a new card. But here's what we want you to do. When you look at this card, it has a lot of different information on it. We want this to be a purposeful card that we use, all right, to connect the church to you and to meet your needs. Because if not... There's no way that I can get my team and our team to get with, with everybody and meet every single prayer request and all that. So we need you to help us. If you're a returning guest, um, like I'm going to point out the subs over here, I know they've been, um, so they've probably filled this out before. They can just put their name at the top. They don't have to fill out the address and all that anymore, their age and all that. Okay? But maybe one of them um, has a prayer request that they'd like to share. And we want you to share with us your prayer requests. They are kept confidential. We do pray over the cards and over your requests that you have. Uh, we want to meet your needs as our New Direction family. So what we'd like for you to do is put down any prayer requests you have. And used to what we would do, is we would have you put these in the offering buckets. But guess what? We didn't give you enough time to fill them out, so it didn't even make sense. What we're going to do now is you're going to have plenty of time to fill it out. If you made a decision for Christ, if you rededicated your life, you're going to have time to do that. And at the end of the service, we have people at the back that are going to have black buckets. Like the offering comes in, 
and you will simply just fold it or whatever and just stick it in there. So it makes it a living document. In the coming weeks, we're going to put the service opportunities on the back of it so you can also see that. I think that's all I have for right now, other than the ones that were going behind me at the beginning of the service. Um, if you'll go ahead and stand up and greet someone around you that maybe you haven't seen or maybe you saw 10 years ago at your class reunion, okay? So go ahead and do that, and um, then we'll go ahead. All right, morning, everybody. Y'all can continue greeting and whatever. I just, I'm kind of feeling led to say something, so y'all keep greeting, and then when y'all get ready, everybody, I'm going to invite you to stand and, and worship. Um, the song, the first song we're going to lead you guys in is called Remind Me Who I Am, and uh, I don't know if you've ever been at a point where you look in the mirror and you don't like, you don't like what you see about yourself, and you kind of just forget who you are in Christ, you know. I, I've had those experiences even, even recently, and... Uh, I just want to encourage y'all and tell you that God loves you. You belong to Him. He looks at you and He sees His beloved. And uh, it was crazy because I, I had our pastor text me the other day. I was in a, a huge group of uh, worshipers in California. And I was feeling so out of place. I was like, man, these people are just so spiritual. And here I am, you know, I, I still have struggles and this and that and the other. And I looked at my phone and uh, Matthew said to the words, you belong mean anything. And uh, it was just a reminder, and I actually had a couple more people come to me that I were strangers and tell me that. So, um, God, you belong to God. You're His. You're His beloved. So just keep that in mind.
sound nice that much. Just kind of turn it off. I'm gonna pray over it real quick. Father, we just thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you for every person here, Lord. Uh, we know that you care and love about every person that's here. So we just pray that you would touch the hearts, Lord, and we pray as we give back, Lord, that you would just take this money and use it, Lord, to further your kingdom and just uh, spread your gospel throughout this, this uh, city. In Jesus' name. I'm the lead pastor here. That was my wife, Michelle, doing announcements this morning. Um, some of y'all complained y'all wanted something a little better looking to look at during announcements, so got her to do it this morning. But uh, if you are with us last Sunday, you know that we're talking about cores and the cores of who we are as a church. But not only that, but the cores of who we are as people in this church. The last Sunday, we hit on the very first one. It was, we will love and long for God because after all, that is the foundation upon which everything else rests. Today, if you didn't catch it from the video, we're talking about truth. And this is something that's a little near and dear to my heart because I just turned 30 years old about two weeks ago, and I'm in a, a generation where we've come up a little bit different than, uh, than some of you older ones in here. My generation grew up in where if we wanted to know about something, we could pull out our phones we could pull out our computer and we could literally Google search it and in 30 seconds have every article, every book, every story, everything that everybody has ever taught on a certain subject. And sadly, though, what a lot of people in my generation are finding out, as well as people in other generations, is that what always glitters isn't always gold. What always looks good, what's always taught as truth and taught as right or taught as the end-all, be-all, isn't necessarily God's truth. And there's a lot of people in my generation, Kevin kind of alluded to this as he was, as he was uh, giving his little mini testimony for the, the service this morning. We go chasing after these things that we think are going to make our life better, and we think are in the right direction, and we chase after them for a certain amount of time, and we come to find out that it's really a dead-end road. And so like no, none other before, this country is primed for revival because people are tired of chasing stuff that isn't real. They're tired of chasing things that's only going to let them down because it's the world's truth and it's not God's truth. And the world's truth is letting them down. So before I get into this message this morning, we're going to have to look at truth and we're going to have to understand one thing about truth because in order to receive truth, you got to kind of understand one concept about it. And true truth, God's truth, is integrated with love. And if we don't understand that concept, then more times than not, we look at somebody or God giving us truth, and we don't take it as truth, but instead we take it as judgment. It's somebody that's trying to tell me how to run my life that ain't got no business trying to run my, tell me how to run my life. Or we try to take it, as uh, 
as some, or, or we take God, for instance, as maybe God trying to nitpick and maybe God trying to steal our fun. We've all felt like that from time to time. We'll be honest in here. We ain't got to be super Christians. But we have to realize that God's truth is tied to his love with us. And that's why he gives us the truth. I was thinking of a good illustration this morning. And I, and I texted my buddy John, the ball of wonder who ain't here this morning. But he was, he's a parent and he's got kids about, you know, six, seven, eight years old. And so they're going out and living life and doing their thing and stuff. And so he's constantly having to pull them back as a good parent. Constantly having to pull them out of trouble. And I said, man, what's a good illustration like, you know, that, uh, that, that, that Luke and Grayson are always doing stuff, and stuff. He said, well, man, they want to do everything, man. He said, you know, Grayson, she always wants to eat candy all the time. Man, it's all she wants to eat is candy. He said, and the little girl's teeth would fall out of her head if we let her eat candy all the time. He said, she weighed 20 pounds if we let her because she wouldn't have any nutrients or anything like that. So even John, though John loves Grayson, and he wants to see her happy and go after those candy bars and those Tootsie Pops and those things that are shiny and seem good. He loves her enough to give her the truth. And as pastor of this church, I love each and every one of you. And so if I see a bump in the road and stuff because I've lived it myself, I'm going to come to you and give you the truth because I love you. That's the same truth that God gives us. He tells us the truth because he wants to protect us from ourselves and because he wants to guide us in truth closer to him so we understand that concept and now we're not looking at it from from a judgmental point of view and now we're not looking at it as a condemned point of view i want you to take you to the first scripture this morning it comes from psalms chapter 18 verse 30 and i got three right off the bat this morning and you won't have to look up every one of these because we're going to put them on the board for those of y'all that are new here. This is in Psalms, and it's talking about God the Father. It says, God's way is perfect. All the Lord's promises prove true. And then in John chapter 14, verse 6, this is Jesus talking. He says, I am the way, the truth, in the life. And then in John chapter 16, verse 13, he said, and this is Jesus talking again, he's talking about the Holy Spirit. He says, when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. So, in essence, right there, the very Trinity of God is laid out in truth. Truth is and honesty is indwelt in God's very personality. He couldn't get away from it, even if he tried. So when God whispers something into our lives, we know and we can accept without a shadow of a doubt that it's going to be right, and it's going to be with God's best intentions. God will never mislead you as the world does. So many times, people try to go to us and give us truth and give us things that look good and want us to believe it and want us to trust it and follow us. But in turn, we find out in months and years that they've kind of had wrong intentions. That's not God, and that's not who he is. And by the way, if you don't know truth, I encourage each and every one of you to, to take this book. This is free. This ain't even a sermon. And don't take my word for the truth, Okay? Don't take your grandma and your granddaddy's word for the truth because they were a preacher. Don't take your mom and daddy's word for the truth. Don't take the church's word for the truth. But get down with yourself and search out this word and get God to tell you the truth. Because unless God shows it to you and reveals it to you, you don't know the truth for yourself. You're just taking man's word for it. And that's a dangerous place to so I encourage each and every one of you to do that. In my life, perhaps, and I probably shouldn't say this, but I'm going to anyway. I, <laughs> I learned more about God and what God was to me when I was offended by church. And I didn't step through church's doors for probably six years of my life because I shut out all the, the voices in my head that were telling me how I should view God 
and what God was and what God was. And I let God tell me. And I'm not saying don't come to church. Don't go back and say I'm saying you don't, shouldn't go to church. But what I did was I shut out the distractions long enough for God to tell me. And so then when I know facts, when I know things, I don't think it because I learned it from so-and-so preacher or because so-and-so in the community told me. I feel confident in it because God revealed that truth to me. Amen. We'll get on, get on with it here. It's, um, God is truth. And as Christians, we accept that all he says is truth. We don't get the right to choose for ourselves. I want to take you to the next bit of scripture this morning. It comes from Romans. It's chapter 1, verse, uh, mm, let's do uh, verse 18. And we'll read down until we stop. It says, But God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. They know the truth about God because he has made it obvious to them. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they clearly see his invisible qualities. His eternal power and divine nature. Literally what it means is God is showing you that he is God and he is supreme. And he knows what's best because he created that out there. So why wouldn't we take him for his word as the voice of truth in our life? So they have no excuse for not knowing God. 21. Yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. And they began to think up foolish ideas for what God was like. And as a result, their minds became dark and confused. Claiming to be wise, instead they became utter fools. And I read that scripture, and it spoke to me in my life because how many of y'all have ever seen somebody go to school and as Green County people, we're mostly country people. We understand good common sense and stuff. I've seen a lot of people go off to school and divinity schools, or, or not even divinity schools, but just anything under the sun. And they'll get 10 years of education in their life, 10 years of man's wisdom, and they come back an utter moron. Have y'all ever seen that happen? They just lose all common sense because they overthink things to death. And that verse is kind of going along with what's happening in our world today because our world, if we listen to the world, it comes up with all kinds of excuses for why God's truth doesn't apply today. It comes in as like, well, God said it then, but that was 2,000 years ago. He doesn't mean it now. Or God said this in this context, and he doesn't, eh, he doesn't really hold it, us accountable to it anymore. In fact, you know, in my life, I live part of that because, like I said, I always didn't walk with the Lord. For a few years of my life, I walked away from the Lord. There's a thing about truth. The devil can wrap up a lie and feed it to you in such a way that you can't hardly really tell whether it's truth or a lie. And if you live around the wrong, the wrong people long enough, if you find yourself in the wrong places long enough, wrong situations long enough you're living around lies if it ain't the truth it's a lie and after a few years of that the truth becomes so blurred that you don't even know your way back to the truth and it's by only God's grace that you ever will make it back and that's what God did to me because even when I, I wanted to come back to God I've been living in a lie so long that I couldn't even recognize God's truth anymore. God's truth never changes, despite your circumstance. Your circumstance might change. You might change. Your experiences might change, and the world and the culture around you might change. But who God is and God's standard for right and wrong never changes. We're moving along to Exodus Chapter 32. I'm taking y'all all around the Bible today. I'll give y'all a little background of what's going on here. We're going all the way back to Moses' time. Now, a little background of what's going on right now is 
Moses has just led the Israelites out of Egypt. God did all of these miracles, probably more than he'd ever done since the beginning of the earth in that day. And he showed off his power to the people of Israel and to the whole world at that time. Because it was a miracle that Israel was let out of Egypt. I mean, he sent plagues of frogs, of blood, of hail, of locusts, and everything. And so God had showed off his power, and he had brought them through the wilderness, and he had gave them, given water from a rock, and he sends word through Moses. He says, look, he says, I want to do something special with Israel, just like Israel is today. He said, I want the world to know my name and who I am through the people of Israel. I want the world to look at Israel and know and see the blessing of my hand on this nation. And I'm going to show them an example. I'm going to make an example out of y'all. And what the covenant God did with Israel, he said, look, guys, he said, I'll make a deal with you. He said, if you agree to follow me and follow my commands and honor me, I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to pour out blessings on you like you would never even believe. And the only thing I ask is that you follow me and obey me. And so Moses took this thing back to Israel, and, and he laid it out amongst the people, and because God doesn't force anything on you. God always gives you a choice. And the people of Israel, they said, that sounds like a good deal. Sounds easy enough. Sign me up. And God actually, he, he come to him a second time and he said, look, if you follow me, do you agree? And once again, they said yes. And so God calls Moses back to the mountain and stuff. And Moses goes up on the mountain once again. God says, good, I'm glad y'all agree to it. I want to give you further instructions. Moses goes trudging up the mountain. He says, look, guys, I'm going to talk to the Lord. I'll be back in a while. Y'all just keep on doing your thing till I get back. I'm paraphrasing, of course, doing it in Green County's terms. And so Moses trudges on up the mountain to talk with the Lord again and get further instructions. And this is what happened in verse 32. When the people saw how long it was taking Moses to come back down the mountain, they gathered Aaron. You know how long Moses was up on that mountain for? He was up on that mountain for a total of 40 days, not even six weeks. Don't seem like a long time, but, you know, I guess it does. He said, come on, they said, make us some gods who can lead us. We don't know what happened to this fellow Moses who brought us here from the land of Egypt. And notice what happens here. As time goes on, their faith began to wane in God. Time drug out, and immediately they began to doubt the truth that God gave them, the truth that he would always look after them and always be there for him. And their faith began to wander, and they began to do bad things. And so, in verse 2, it says, So Aaron said, Take the gold rings from the ears of your wives and sons and daughters, and bring them to me. And all the people took the gold rings from their ears, and they brought them down to Aaron. And then Aaron took the gold, and he melted it down, and molded it into the shape of a calf. And when the people saw it, they exclaimed, Oh, yeah, Israel, these are the gods who brought us out of the land of Egypt. Aaron saw how excited the people were, so he built an altar in front of the calf. Then he announced, Tomorrow will be a festival to the Lord. And then the people got up early the next morning. And when it says the people here, it literally means every person got up the next morning to go sacrifice, burnt offerings and peace offerings. After this, they celebrated with feasting and drinking and indulged in pagan revelry, which you can only imagine what went on when you get left to your own sinful desires and to be led however you want to live. Verse 7, And then the Lord told Moses, Moses up there on the mountain, and the Lord is seeing what's going on. And this is the Lord's response to what he's seeing. He says, Quick, go down the mountain. Your people whom you brought from the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. How quickly they have turned away from me how I have commanded them to live. So it took six weeks for the people began to doubt the promises of God. God made an oath with Israel with his very name. And what happened in the land of Israel is that circumstances changed. And that they got faced with a little bit of time where they began to doubt. 
And so instead of clinging on to the promises of God, they decided to cling on to the promises of man and try to make up their own truth. Despite six weeks of Moses being gone and Moses being absent, God wasn't absent. Time went on, but truth never changed. They thought God's truth had backed out on them and God had reneged on his word, but God was watching the whole time. God was watching all along. He was disappointed in him. What happens in our lives, God will make a promise to us to love us and always be there for us. We know that. And then situations change. Something will be happen to make it look like God is absent or God has forgotten about us. It might be for 40 days, it might be for a year, it might be for 40 years, but God's promise is still there. God is still watching you. Just like the people of Israel, God's truth and God's promise didn't change despite the circumstance change. In fact, the circumstance was left just as it was. I'd like to leave you in one last point for today. Hmm. One point that I wanted to hit on real quick is just because something is accepted by the majority does not make it truth. Um, and that's a good thing. That's some good preaching right there. I don't know how I almost forgot that point. The entire nation of Israel decided they were going to abandon their promise to God and go worship a calf made of gold. So, just because the situation's changed, the status quo didn't. I'm not going to go to the creamery when I get off of here and worship a cow just because God doesn't really show up the way I expect him to. That doesn't even make sense, people. I mean, you just made something for yourself, and now you're going to worship it as the thing that created you? It just seems so foolish to me. But in fact, every lie is just as foolish if we look at it and we take it and we look at it from God's perspective. Even the lies we accept today, even the ones that are polished up as beautiful as gold. And literally, when Moses come down this mountain, the entire nation was falling against God and it accepted a lie. The entire nation was not only following this, but they were celebrating a lie. And your friends that you're hanging out with might accept something as God's truth, but that doesn't mean it is God's truth. Your family might accept something as God's truth. May even be celebrating it. May even be trying to get you to come on board with it. That doesn't mean God wants you to. And a lot of times as a people, as friends, as family members, as people of this country, we think just because everybody else is agreeing to it, then it automatically makes it okay. And it automatically makes, maybe God has changed with the people. God isn't changing. People change, but God's word stays the same, stays the same, despite the times, despite the circumstances. In Hebrews chapter 6, verse 16 through 19. I'm talking on one last point on truth because truth oftentimes we feel like it holds us back and it keeps us from fun. It keeps us from uh, accepting and making our own truth and living the life we, we want to lead and stuff. But th th that's not it. Truth is made as a protection to keep us away from harm. God knows and sees the world 50 years from now, 500 years from now. He knows your life before you even live it. And so when he gives you truth and he gives you a word and he gives you a promise, he's not giving you a rule to keep you from having fun. He's giving you a rule to keep you safe, as a good mom and a daddy do. But God not only does that, but he also gives us our truth, his truth in his character, as a promise to stand on and have hope. Hebrews 6, 19. Hex 6, verse 16, excuse me. It says, now when people take an oath, 
they call on someone greater than themselves to hold them to it. And without any question, that oath is binding. God also bound himself with the oath so that those who received the promise could perfectly be sure that he would never change his mind. So God has given his promise and his oath. These two things are unchangeable because it is impossible for God to lie. Therefore, we who have fled to him for refuge can have great confidence as we hold to the hope that lies before us. This hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls. And what i like to do real quick is keep going to Genesis, flip all the way back to the beginning of Genesis chapter 3. And I promise I'm going to tie this in with truth. In verse, 10, in verse 15 in Genesis, what had happened is Adam had sinned against God. Adam had went out and searched his own truth pretty much, Adam and Eve in the garden. God gave him the truth, which was don't eat from the tree. One simple truth. I know what's right from wrong. Don't eat from this tree, guys. Well, they went and they tried to make the truth their own truth. And they took a bite of that apple. It better have been some apple pie for me because Matthew ain't going to go against God for an apple. He's going he to go against God for something better than an apple. So if you want to me in a lie, you better give me something better than an apple. But anyway, they tried to make up their own truth by eating the apple and, and, and gaining the knowledge of God. And instead, all they got was the sin, co- the, the, the sin promise. In other words, the, the sin curse on them and stuff. And they literally, God had just called them out on it. And this is what God is talking to the woman. He says, and I will cause hostility between you and the woman. He's talking to the snake. And the snake in this sense represents sin. There you go. Y'all are some little theologians in here. It says, and I will cause hostility between you and the woman and bring between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. And a good parallel to this, I'm going over to the whiteboard, so you know it's about to be real. In Genesis, God says to the serpent, which represents sin, that I will cause hostility between you and the woman. God spoke in a prophet prophecies even back then. And so sometimes we have to read between the lines and we have to interpret things and uh, and go back and see what God meant. And he meant it in two different ways here. So there'll be division here between you and the woman and people. And he will strike your head, cut off your head, and you will strike his heel. Now, thousands of years later, despite circumstances changing, despite generations being raised up and falling away, despite us letting God down and doing everything in the world to throw away what he said here, God spoke this in truth because in Jesus came, Jesus was that woman's offspring, by the way. His mother was Mary. Jesus, when he died on the cross, he cut off the head of sin and the curse that it had on the world. This verse isn't just a verse between man and snakes. It's a prophecy of Jesus. When sin struck the feet of Jesus, nailed him to the cross, Jesus cut off the snake's head for good. In the very beginning, God knew what you and I would need. In the very beginning, Jesus was, and he was promised in truth. Truth. Jesus saw you. 
from the very beginning of the earth. Truth. Jesus, God knew what you would need, and you need Jesus. Truth. God loves you today. Truth. This promise is still accountable for you today because God's truth never changes. Your hope is in God's word and your hope is in God's truth. As Kevin and the guys come up here to close this out, I'd just like to end in a prayer. Um, Lord, I, um, I thank you for God for holding us accountable to your standard and keeping us safe by your standard, God, because um, if we walk like you and we talk like you and we look like you, God, then our lives are going to be so much safer and, and so much better. But God, I also thank you so much more, God, for your promise that you gave us even from the beginning of time. You promised that you loved us and that you would keep us and provide for us. And God, that promise that you gave us back then, God, I know it stands even today. And I know because you cannot go back on your word, God, that we still stand on the truth and the promise that you gave us way back in the garden. Because of your truth, God, I am confident this morning in a better life, in the next life. Thank you for your promises, Lord. Thank you for your love. Amen.
I'm not going to make it weird or anything, but I do want to talk to you about it. We love you, and God loves you. Have a good Sunday.